Well, I'm going to go back to that question of race a minute and, and take you back to the days in which I was the director of Christian education. When I was working in a church, I walked into a church that was 40% non-white. And about my first month working in the church, a Sunday school teacher came up to me and said, we have a problem. Little Margaret Brown, who was about four years old, won't do her homework assignment in Sunday school. And I said, well, what's the assignment? The assignment was to find uh, pictures from a magazine of a family and cut them out and paste them and make a, a picture. The trouble was all of the magazines upstairs had nothing but white families in them. There was no Essence, there was no Ebony, there were no magazines that reflected Margaret Brown's family, which was a, an African family. Not just African American, but African. And so she couldn't find pictures that looked like her, and as a four-year-old she said, none of these pictures look like my family. Those are the sorts of issues of the familiar that we take for granted. The magazines that had been donated to the church reflected what was familiar for the people that were donating them. And no one thought to check and to see, not only in terms of the magazines, but also in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the books available for the students, in terms of any of that sort of information, whether or not what was familiar was actually representative of who was in the congregation. I think the church or a Center for Ethics, such as the one I direct, for example, um, faces a particular challenge. There's a kind of an irony of this self-deception that I've spoken of that we have a great desire to see ourselves as righteous. And so this is a difficult thing for those of us who are working for social change uh, in any field to not develop a kind of self-righteousness that blinds us to the fact that perhaps we're becoming complicit ourselves in some of the very problems that we're trying to solve. It also is true that the church, and again, a, an academic ethics center like my own, um, can't ever really separate itself from the institutional forces that ultimately make its existence possible. Um, our center, for example, relies greatly on funding from individuals and corporations, um, many of whom are actually the subject of our critique. This creates a real challenge for those of us that wish to do an honest kind of critique and be authentic in our work and yet at the same time maintain relationships with uh, those who support us. My center just made a very difficult decision to decline a $2 million gift from an individual donor whose interests we ultimately determined were not in alignment with the mission and values of the center. Um, it wasn't just a matter of uh, is this going to pull us off mission or is it going to in some way uh, turn us in a direction that would be uh, inappropriate for the center? Uh, it was also, though that was fairly easy to see, but it was also the fact that $2 million can go a long way toward doing good work, toward meeting the payroll and toward funding projects and research and programs that might actually help us to accomplish the mission. And I think that the challenge for us is to be open-eyed about this, to recognize that we are, in fact, um, complicit in the very things that we are critiquing, if for no other reason than that we accept money from those that we wish to critique. And it's easy in a place like a seminary to pretend that all the money that comes into our hands is pure and, and untarnished in any way, but the reality is um, we live in a complex environment where we need to be very conscious of the, the uh, inherent tension that exists between being prophetic, uh, uh, speaking the gospel without fear, and at the same time uh, maintaining relationships with those who um, at some, at, in some cases uh, really seem to be uh, the very problem that we wish to resolve. I teach worship. I often emphasize on uh, the necessity and the importance of keeping uh, the Sabbath holy. Uh, it depends on our socioeconomic status that we all have a different ways to keep the Sabbath uh, holy. I want to look into the uh, Exodus account of the Ten Commandments or the Deuteronomy account 
it has a slightly different uh, perspective. Uh, why in all Ten Commandments that we uh, we don't keep them all to uh, faithfully, yet the fourth commandment that which we uh, often tell others proudly that we are uh, not keeping. And, um, the time uh, issue here. Uh, Exodus would uh, go into the God's creation and, and how we are to enjoy uh, uh, as being created uh, and also along with other, crea uh, other creations and creatures. But Deuteronomy talks about the slaves uh, in Egypt. Uh, you are to free uh, others, the freedom issue. Um, even the animals don't let them work, uh, and, and and that coming in God's presence with that gratitude, the thankfulness, because God has been so wonderful to our life, our life in the past six days, and that there's nothing more that I can do. Uh, it's the real essence that which we need to approach uh, week to week, uh, Sunday to Sunday, as we come to worship. And and, um, and we are indeed a free a human being uh, on this occasion when we come to worship, and and, and that I uh, feel is a very important issue in our modern uh, day 